so welcome everyone. Today we have a really wonderful opportunity to have Peter Fraser joining us. Uh, Peter is a professor at Cornell University and he's also a staff data scientist at Uber. Uh, so I always thought of Peter as a word expert in Bayesian optimization, uh, but I recently realized that he actually also led a COVID-19 mathematical modeling team to design Cornell's testing strategy so that they can get the students back early. Uh, so today at our BaseOp speaker series, he'll tell us about how to leverage the problem structure in Bayesian optimization and then turn the black box optimization to a gray box one. All right, let's welcome Peter. Wonderful, thank you, Z. Uh, yeah, it's wonderful to be here and to talk to a group of people that that include you know so many experts and people that I you know I really admire and um, yeah it's just a, it's a great opportunity to be able to talk to all of you. So I'm going to be talking about an area that I'm really excited about that's called gray box Bayesian optimization, and I'm going to be talking about the work of quite a few different students and collaborators of mine and, uh, and, and both you know within my group and, um, and then also I'll be talking about some other papers that uh, I, I didn't have anything to do with but that are involved in this line of research and, and that I think are interesting and, and, and cool. All right. Great. Um, so I understand that this is a base up speaker series. So I assume that that means that everybody knows the, the basics of Bayesian optimization. Um, maybe based on facial reactions, I'll judge kind of how quickly to, to go through this. I just wanted to make sure that uh, for people that are new, that they have a foundation so that the, the things that I'm saying make sense. So in Bayesian optimization, we do many things, uh, but the most common thing that we do is to solve problems like the following. So I have an objective function, uh, f, that usually is, um, unless you read Z's papers, is low dimensional, uh, although there's been a lot of work in, in high dimensional Bayesian optimization. Um, often in the, in the kind of the most standard problems, the feasible space that we're optimizing the objective function over is, let's say, a hyper rectangle. Uh, the objective function is often assumed to be and actually is often continuous, but it lacks special structure like concavity uh, or you know some other kind of structure that would, that would make it really easy to optimize. Also, when you evaluate F, the evaluations are often derivative free, so they don't provide gradient information. And the thing that makes these problems really hard is that the evaluations uh, are often really time consuming or may actually be ex expensive. They might be time consuming if they come from, uh, you know, solving a PDE on a supercomputer. They might be monetarily expensive if they run, if they come from running an A-B experiment in a, you know, in a, in a, in a two-sided marketplace somewhere uh, where you really need to spend money. And then in some settings, evaluations of F uh, might be noisy. Bayesian optimization is really useful. It's been probably most widely used in, uh, in hyperparameter tuning for machine learning, you know, in, in AutoML, uh, where it's used quite a bit. And I understand uh, at Google to, uh, and at Uber to, to tune machine learning algorithms. But that's not the only place where it's used. It originated in the, let's call it the engineering design literature, where the interest was in uh, designing things that you could simulate using physics-based uh, computational codes, and it's, it's still widely used there. Um, it's useful for doing market design. Uh, also uh, very useful for doing app design, website design, choosing parameters in um, algorithms that, for example, might, might operate some revenue management system. And then something that I'm very interested in is applications in uh, material science, and in drug discovery, where your evaluations can take easily days, uh, it might take weeks. So, you know, just to make sure everyone has has the basics, roughly how Bayes up works is that 
I would choose a Bayesian prior distribution on my objective function, typically a Gaussian process. And then I have some budget for experiments that I can use. And I'll iteratively use that um, here in a setting where I'm just doing one measurement at a time, where I, I find my point in uh, the feasible space that maximizes some acquisition function, which measures the value of, uh, of an evaluation towards some optimization goal. Some, this basically quantifies the value of information. And it depends both on the point at which I'm proposing to evaluate the objective and my current posterior distribution over that objective function. Then I evaluate the objective there, uh, observe its value, and then I update the posterior distribution. I'm gonna be talking a lot about uh, a generalization of expected improvement. Uh, expected improvement is probably something that most of you are, are familiar with. Um, let me just uh, uh, sort of define it um, in this context. So let's say that I've evaluated the objective function at a collection of points, x1 through xn, pictured here as these blue circles. And the, these evaluations define a, a posterior distribution, which is also a Gaussian process, and whose mean function I'm plotting here is the solid red line, and whose, uh, uh, whose standard deviation can also be computed. And so I'm showing um, Bayesian credible intervals for the, uh, for the value of the objective as a, as a function of where I am in the input space and in just a one dimensional problem. Then I'll let F star be the value of the best point that I've evaluated so far uh, if, if I'm maximizing. Um, and then what I do is I do a thought experiment and I think through, if I were to evaluate at a point X, let's say X is equal to 200, then I would observe a quantity whose value is under the posterior, normally distributed with a mean given by this and a standard deviation um, you know, given by the, the width of this Bayesian credible interval. And, uh, and then after that realization of that, uh, normally distributed random variable, I would realize some improvement in the value of the best point that I would have, have, have observed. And that improvement can be written like uh, f of x minus the previous best. And if that quantity is positive, then that's my improvement. If that quantity is negative, then I get nothing. And so I take the positive part. And then the expected improvement is just uh, uh, the expected value of that quantity. And so, you know, if, if you're familiar with this area, then you know that uh, expected improvement has an, has an analytic expression um, that's easy to compute and that trades, uh, that tends to be large when the variance is large and also tends to be large when the, when the posterior mean is large. And so, you know, one can, uh, one can apply this iteratively where I would evaluate at the point with largest expected improvement, um, then update my posterior distribution and then uh, recompute the expected improvement, find the point that maximizes it and repeat. And then after just hopefully a small number of evaluations, uh, if I have defined my prior distribution in a way that uh, matches my problem reasonably well, then um, you know, with some luck, I'll have found a point that approximately maximizes the underlying objective function f. So all of that is well known to you if you are familiar with Bayesian optimization. Something else that you know, is, is sort of widely understood is that what Bayesian optimization do, does is you know, it treats the objective function as a black box. We, we try to use very little information about the objective function in designing these algorithms. And that's been a big part of the power of these methods. You don't need to, you don't really, you know, they're, they're generic methods, right? I can write a code that uh, um, performs quite well um, without really leveraging information uh, about the objective function. But at the same time, we give up a lot when we do that. We give up just a huge amount of information that we could profitably use towards 
finding much better solutions with much less time uh, as compared with a method that understood a little bit more about the objective function. So gray box Bayesian optimization is all about asking, can we do better uh, by looking inside of this of inside of this black box? Here's some kind of horse race numerical comparison plots from the the method that I'm going to focus on through through the bulk of this talk. Uh, and so you know if on the x-axis, I'm plotting the number of function evaluations. So think of each one of these as an hour of computation that I'm using for, uh, you know, for example, for tuning some um, hyperparameters in some auto ML uh, application. And on the y-axis, I'm plotting on a log scale, the regret. So the difference in quality between the best point that I've found and the global optimum of this function. And I'm looking at a collection of different methods. So up here, uh, we have, for example, expected improvement, probability of improvement, just random search, uh, uh, predictive entropy search. These are all standard methods that you know treat the objective function as a black box, right? And they do reasonably well. So the you know you get two orders of magnitude improvement in the regret with something on the order of 50 to 100, uh, I apologize, 50 to 100 function evaluations. Down here, I'm showing you some new methods that aren't very complicated. Uh, if you have some expertise with Bayesian optimization, after you see the talk, I, I bet that you'd be able to code up one of these methods. Um, and they're also broadly available in, in software packages. They're, they're not particularly fancy methods, but they have one advantage they look inside the black box and they leverage problem structure. And as a result, instead of reaching a log regret of on the order of zero after 100 evaluations, they get a log regret of uh, minus five after half of that. So you really get a dramatic performance improvement if you're willing to sacrifice some generality in order to use problem structure. There are lots of different problems in the world, and that means that there's lots of different kinds of problem structure that can be profitably exploited in different ways. My group has been working on methods kind of in, in three different directions, um, something that I call compositions and function networks, uh, which is going to be the focus of uh, what I'll talk about today. Then also um, what, what I call objective constituent evaluation. So um, this would be a setting where the objective function is, is created by performing a collection of smaller computations. And uh, you can choose to do only some of those constituent evaluations with much less time. And if you can figure out a way to um, to incorporate those partial evaluations into some kind of a Bayesian framework, uh, you can then dramatically accelerate performance. So, so there's a collection of um, both kind of older methods, this uh, Swirsky et al. paper that some of you may be familiar with, uh, thinks about objective functions uh, from auto ML, like in cross-validation where the objective function is, a, you know, is an average across folds of uh, validation error. And you can choose to just evaluate a subset of those folds. Um, and then there's, there's we've, my group's been working on uh, other methods in this space, um, also thinking about uh, s objective functions that are sums, um, and then also nonlinear functions uh, arising from risk measures where you can get similar benefits. And then there's also longstanding work in Bayesian optimization on multi-fidelity uh, Bayes opt. And so you can think about that as a gray box method uh, for example, when you are, and I'll talk about it at, at the end of the talk, when you're doing auto ML uh, for a machine learning method that's you know, solving an optimization problem iteratively, like most machine learning methods do, and you can, uh, you can, you can leverage observations of the progress of those iterative solvers. For example, for you know, SGD in a 
in a neural net or you know some kind of RL algorithm that, that's using an iterative optimization scheme. But what I want to do is to be concrete, I want to focus on uh, compositions. And in particular, I want to I want to focus on one paper with a PhD student of mine, um, Raul Astadillo, from two years ago at ICML called Bayesian Optimization of Composite Functions. And this will give you uh, a sense for one approach to gray box optimization, Bayesian optimization, and also why these methods can be so powerful uh, if you're if you're if you're willing to leverage some problem structure. So we're going to be in the following setting. We're going to maximize an objective function f, and f is going to be the composition of two functions. It's going to be uh, an inner. I call it an inner function h, and this is going to map uh, the feasible domain. Think of this as just a rectangle, hyper rectangle, uh, in d dimensions. It maps that hyper rectangle. Uh, onto uh, Rm. So it's a vector valued output with m dimensions. This is going to be a time consuming to evaluate black box function. And I'm going to model it using a Gaussian process. Then I have another function g, which takes this vector valued, takes a vector valued input supplied by h and produces a scalar valued output. And I'm going to assume that G is fast to compute. It's an analytic function that I can code up and compute in milliseconds. And I can also calculate its gradient uh, extremely quickly. So where does this problem show up? One setting, and this is a place where we, we started to work on this problem is, we had a joint project with some folks at ExxonMobil. And what they do is they have uh, wells that they drill into the earth and they measure uh, the amount of oil that comes out. Um, uh, and they also measure the, the pressure at which the oil comes out. And then based on these, you can think of them as observations, uh, they would like to calibrate a physics-based simulator of the you know, underground phenomena in order to match these observations. So they have a vector of parameters. These are physical parameters that go into the simulator. And they have uh, a vector of observational data. So this would be for each well that they've, that they've drilled into the earth, the pressure of the oil, that's coming out of that well. And then they have their physics-based model that when you pass in this parameter vectors x, it produces a prediction, um, hj of x, for what the pressure for uh, the jth well should have produced. And they're interested in finding a vector x that minimizes the sum of squared errors between their observations and what their physics-based uh, simulator predicts. So you put this into the, uh, the Bayesian optimization of composite functions framework by taking the uh, time consuming to evaluate physics-based simulator, and that's your inner function h, and then your outer function g is just the function that uh, that translates that vector into this um, sum of squared errors. And G is really simple to compute. It's just, you know, um, uh, it's just the, the sum of squared differences uh, between each component of its input and some fixed uh, target value yj. So that's just one, you know, example in order to make it concrete, uh, hopefully, for people. This also shows, you know, similar kinds of problems also, also show up, for example, in inverse reinforcement learning, where I have observed behavior, let's say from, you know, from Uber drivers, and uh, I'm gonna model those individuals as behaving optimally with respect to some utility function over, uh, you know, the money that they earn and the amount of effort that they need to put into earning that money. 
And if I specify a utility function, a reinforcement learning solver would make a prediction for what their observed behavior might be. Uh, and then what I would like to do is to find the parameters of the utility functions that uh, best matches ob observed behavior. So that would be some kind of, you know, sum of squared errors or some, sum of absolute errors or, you know, some other kind of uh, aggregate loss function over the different predictions and, uh, and, and, and the error that they have in predicting some observations. And then you can also add in regularization, if you like, uh, into this framework. Another setting is materials design, where when I want to design, you know, a, a new material, typically there's a collection of different material attributes that I can measure and that I want to design toward. And those attributes are then mapped through an aggregate performance measure, which is some known nonlinear function uh, of, those, of those vectors. Also in engineering design, um, I may have a, an inner function which computes physical, kind of physical performance characteristics that summarize, for example, the design of an aircraft in terms of lift and, and drag, um, maybe as a function of angle of attack and velocity of that aircraft. Uh, and then some outer function that takes those physical characteristics to kind of a, a description of the engineering design's performance and translates it into an economic uh, outcome that, that I would want to optimize. Um, there's, there's, there's some related work, both understanding the value in kind of classical optimization of leveraging this kind of composite functions uh, structure. Um, there's work on special cases of this problem. For example, constrained Bayesian optimization is a special case of this problem where if I have one constraint, then uh, I can think of I can think of maximizing h0 of x subject to a constraint on h1 of x as being written as, uh, as, as, a, as a problem of composite functions where the outer function uh, checks whether the, the component of h corresponding to the constraint is satisfying the constraint. If it is, it returns uh, the component of h that corresponds to the objective. And if it doesn't, it returns a an extremely pessimistic value that you know that that, that you would never want to choose as as your optimal solution. Uh, there's also work uh, on Bayesian optimization for sums. Uh, I've mentioned this paper by um, Swarovski, Snowak, and Adams that thinks about uh, uh, cross validation. So that would fit into this framework as well, where um, H is outputting the performance on each fold, and then G of H is returning the average of performance across the folds. The paper that I'm gonna detail appeared at ICML in 2019. And so since that time, actually, there's been a, a few papers following on, uh, some by, by my group and um, others by, by some other groups. And I'll in particular talk about uh, this paper from uh, the group at Facebook. Okay, so, how would standard Bayesopt approach this problem that I detail? It would fit a Gaussian process to the observations of the objective function f. It would ignore the it would ignore the the fact that this objective function happens to be a composition, and it would just directly fit a GP to those observations. Then it would find the point X that maximizes the, uh, the expected improvement computed using that GP. And then it would observe at X and it would repeat until the budget was exhausted. So it would do nothing special to leverage knowledge of composite functions. What would the, the, the approach that Raul and I are proposing do in this setting? So it, in many ways it's, it's very similar, uh, so similar that I can take the same pseudocode and just add some words. Instead of fitting a Gaussian process to the objective function, what I'm going to do is I'm going to fit a Gaussian process to this expensive function, inner function h. So in the context of this 
oil well calibration problem, I would fit a Gaussian process to the, um, to the predictions for the pressure at each test well. And that would be a vector h of x. Now, because it's vector valued, I don't want to fit a scalar Gaussian process to it. I want to fit a, a multi-output Gaussian process. Uh, in practice, in our numerical experiments, this multi-output Gaussian process is, is just a collection of independent GPs, one for each individual output. But you know, one, one can do more sophisticated things uh, involving correlated, uh, correlated outputs. Okay, so, but I have a Bayesian model for H, uh, and this is leveraging the fact that I'm observing not just the objective function, but also uh, the values of H when I'm running my code. Then I define a new acquisition function uh, that I'll call EI for composite functions. And it's defined in a way that looks the same. The only difference is that I replace the objective function, which in standard Bayesian optimization is modeled as a Gaussian process. And so, you know, in standard Bayesian optimization, this quantity uh, is f of x is normally distributed. So in my setting, uh, the, the output of h is a, the output of h at x is a normally distributed random vector. And then I'm applying some, in general, nonlinear function g to that random vector. And then I'm taking the expectation. Okay, and then I, I find the point x that maximizes this quantity, and then I observe uh, not just the objective, but also the, um, the inner function h at that point. So that's the approach. So I was showing you plots earlier that showed that we got, you know, let's say six orders of magnitude improvement uh, over the standard method. That's a big improvement. Why is this method able to deliver that. So I want to give you some intuition with an example. It's going to be a really simple example. Uh, I'm going to have a one-dimensional parameter x. Think of this as the parameter in a simulator that I want to uh, solve this um, calibration problem for. And then h of x is the black is is the is the simulator's prediction. Uh, for some observed data under inputs x. And then y, that's our observed data. So what I want to do is this, um, uh, you know, minimize the squared error kind of problem. All right, so minimize over x, h of x minus y squared. So standard Bayes opt, right? It, observes the objective function, which happens to be h of x minus my y squared. It observes it at three different points um, along the x-axis between minus three and four. And those values are, you know, kind of between five and 10. So I fit a Gaussian process to that. And then I calculate the expected improvement uh, at each point on the domain. And then I find the point for which the expected improvement is the largest. And it happens to be here. This is a point where the posterior mean is low. Remember, I'm trying to minimize and where the variance is, you know, is relatively large. So then my next evaluation would be here. Okay, it doesn't seem terrible. It seems like a reasonable thing to do. And then I would evaluate there. And I would, I, in this example, I actually get an improvement. And I probably feel pretty good about that. And then here's uh, the next point that I would evaluate. So what would a gray box method do in this setting. It gets more information, right? So it observes here the objective function value, which again is h of x minus y squared. But it also observes something else. It observes the inner function, h. And I'm going to plot this, uh, kind of the intuition I think becomes most clear when the thing that I plot is h of x minus y, okay? So the objective is just uh, the thing that I'm plotting squared. And you see that actually there's, 
there's a lot, even though the objective function values are kind of all between five and 10, there's, there's actually a lot of diversity hidden in those objective function values. In particular, when at the lowest value of x, the, uh, the h of x minus y was, was positive. Uh, it was also positive here when x was equal to four. And then in the middle, at x is close to zero, it was negative. And so if you know that h of x is continuous, then you know that um, somewhere in between zero and, and minus three, you know that h of x minus y crosses zero. And because the objective function is h of x minus y squared, that's also telling you that the global optimum, there is a global optimum somewhere in between this point and this point, right? It's just because continuous function has to cross zero. You also know that there's a global optimum somewhere in between this point and this point. So already, you know, from that intuition, hopefully uh, you, you, you start to understand that there's a lot of information that's, that's available here that's not available when you're only observing those values squared. So then when I formalize that using Bayesian uh, machine learning, I fit a GP to H of X, um, which is the same thing as, as fitting a GP to H of X minus Y. And then, uh, you know, and so I have kind of a standard posterior mean and a standard credible interval on H of X minus Y. And then what I do is I compute the expected improvement and you see kind of unusual looking uh, means. So the, um, um, the uh, so what I'm, what I'm showing here is actually the implied posterior on the square, right? And you see the posterior mean is shrinking down towards zero in this neighborhood. That's because with information about H of X minus Y, the posterior believes that it crosses zero somewhere uh, between you know minus two and and minus one, so you see you know a low uh, posterior mean, and this is going to be an area where we're going to get a large expected improvement under the posterior that's implied by this picture. Okay, then I do the evaluation at that suggested point. Indeed the value of h of x is, you know, pretty close to zero, not exactly zero, but pretty close. And I've already gotten a pretty substantial improvement. Now I know that the global optimum is between, you know, this point and this point, and is probably pretty close to this point because its value of h of x minus y is close, so close to zero. Uh, the implied posterior on the objective is very close to zero in the, in the neighborhood of that point. I evaluate there and already I have discovered a, 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 a very good approximate global optimum in only two evaluations. So just to, just to summarize, I have a, uh, in, in standard Bayes opt, I'm fitting a Gaussian process to the square, to the overall objective. And so the expected improvement really doesn't uh, have a lot of information that it can go on in order to find a new global optimum. Whereas in, gray box optimization where I'm leveraging this composite function structure, I am able to find, uh, I, I, may, I get a lot more information about where the global optimum is and I'm able to make a much more intelligent decision about my uh, evaluation. Any questions there? Yeah, Z. Sure. Yeah, I have a question. Uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm wondering like, cause for, usual um, base op acquisition functions like EI, it's usually designed for Gaussian processes. And it doesn't take into account that this is um, a, a distribution that um, like could be like all positive. Mm -hmm. um, so in that yeah. case, does it mean that to actually get the optimal performance we need to not a different search strategy, or do you think um, it's fine? Mm. Yeah, okay, so right. I 
maybe let me say two things about it. I think that's an interesting question. Um, let me say two things in response. So first, the method that I'm proposing, uh, because it knows that the objective function is, uh, is of the form, you know, something minus y squared, it already knows that the that the objective function is is not negative. Uh, you kind of get that for free from the Bayesian framework, um, you know, because if you, yeah, and and you see that here where I'm plotting. Well, I'm plotting a credible interval on the location of the maximum and also and also the mean, and you see that the credible intervals are all um, non-negative. Not only are the credible intervals non-negative, but also the full support of the posterior is uh, contained in the, the positive real line. Um, so that comes for free from the composite uh, function structure. Another point that you that kind of is implicit in your question is, you know, maybe in order to make this a fair comparison, what I should do is also add in standard Bayes opt where it's using, uh, it's treating the objective, it, it's it's done a log transformation on on the objective because you know that's often a thing that people will do. They'll 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 say, oh, I know the objective is not negative. And also, it's changing over many orders of magnitude also. And so let me work with the log. Let me transform my problem so that I'm going to maximize the log of the objective rather than the objective. And um, you know, and then maybe that approach would do better than, um, than standard Bayes opt. Because at least it would know that when you had found something that was uh, equal to 0 in the untransformed space, that that would be um, you know, that the log of 0 is minus infinity. So it would know that. Um, that, that 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 was optimal. So that might be an interesting. We, we actually never uh, did that comparison. Yeah. Does that do folks have any other questions? I I I do have a quick question. Please. Yeah. Uh, so there are infinitely many ways that you can decompose the objective function into composition of you know an H and a G, mm -hmm. and. Uh, it would be very surprising if all of them would lead to improvement in the algorithm. Mm. Do you have mathematical descriptions of the function h that would actually uh, imply improvements in the, in the method? Yeah, that's a great question. We are working on that. We don't have a mathematical. We don't. We don't yet have a mathematical description. I, I do kind of have an intuitive. Description. Something that we observe, a phenomenon where we where we observe that this technique really works well, is when the when 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 G is not a bijection. A thing about about uh, you know G being its input squared or the sum of its input squares is that you map. Two different, you know, you map multiple different inputs into the same output. Uh, so that is, that seems to be. This is not a mathematical statement, um, but that's you know, it, that's often a sufficient condition for this kind of method to work pretty well. There are other methods where this thing works well that uh, where where the input is a, is a, where where g is a bijection. Um, but yeah, I think that's a really interesting question, and and um, there are also settings where this doesn't work particularly well. So when G is a linear function, um, like a, a really vanilla setting, where you, I think it should be obvious that this provides no value, would be let's just say that uh, G of X was equal to H of X plus five. Then the what's going to happen is that when I fit a GP to H. It's just going to be the same as the GP that would, that I would have fit to the objective F, except that it's going to be offset by five, and you know everything is going to kind of the the decisions that are made by expected improvement are translation invariant in the Y space, so that's going to have no impact. Um, so yeah, I think nonlinear non bijections tends to be the place where this adds a lot of value, but I think that there's still really interesting open 
there's really interesting open questions uh, along the lines of what, of what you asked. Hey, thanks. Cool. Okay. So hopefully you, you get some intuition for why this thing works, at least on, you know, some problems. Uh, uh, Peter, just... I think we have one more hand. Oh, sure. Yeah, go from for it. From Eugene. Hi, Peter. Oh, hey, Eugene. Hey, good to see you. Wow. Yeah, that's fine. Cool. Um, nice, to, nice to see Long you. Time to see um, you. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I think 10 years. Um, so I, uh, I, I want uh, to, you're answering that previous question. Um, I, it made me think about the data processing inequality. Mm. Um, it feels very much like you're losing information with the, when you do the um, non-bijective operations. And it seems like you could probably make some formal statements using that. Yeah. Um, but um, I think the, the um, yeah, exactly, the matching what Jonas is saying. Um, I think that uh, the other question, kind of a little bit tangential, but um, you know, I, I think Jasper is here and others, um, and they've been making some progress in you know using ensembles of neural networks and stuff um, as an alternative to a Gaussian process. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I, I mean, it's just kind of like two building blocks. But I was wondering if you had um, played with this, and you know, if this, you know, how much improvement um, you can get with, with combining the two ideas. Yeah. Um, yeah, towards the first point, we have thought a bit about information theory as a kind of an analysis methodology, a class of analysis methods that, that would be profitable. Um, we, yeah, I think we just need to push further on that. Uh, if, you, if you have ideas, um, you know, email me. Uh, in terms of, yeah, ensembles of neural nets, I think of this, you know, we're applying this using, um, you know, using GPs. But you could do the same stuff that I'm going to describe. You'd have to think a little bit about some of the computational aspects a little bit. But um, you know, there's not really anything special about the fact that I'm using a multi-output Gaussian process here. If you had a multi-output ensemble of neural nets, then you could define expected improvement in the same way and uh, and and do the same framework. And I, yeah, and I would bet that. In, I, I would think that in the same kinds of problems where this methodology provides a lot of value over, uh, you know, the traditional approach to Bayesop that ignores the composite functions framework, uh, using Gaussian processes, I, I would think that um, using this with an ensemble of deep neural nets uh, would, would also work really well. And yeah, and it's a cool idea because obviously there are going to be settings h where or, you know problems where your your function h is not particularly well modeled by a gaussian process and where an ensemble of, of neural nets is going to do a lot better and so i would yeah i mean that would be interesting that would be interesting to try out cool thanks cool um let's see i don't see any other hands all right Okay, so that's the kind of the intuition behind the methodology. Let me just say something a little bit about how to implement it because it's implementable and you know that's important for uh, the method to actually be used. So, so it's not totally trivial to use this method because in standard Bayesian optimization, the objective function is Gaussian which means that the expected improvement has a really nice closed form in terms of the posterior mean and the posterior variance. The challenge is that when G is not linear, then this is some uh, non-Gaussian function of a normal random variable. There is a special case actually where G is a square, in which case, um, you know, this is normal and then this is a normal square, and so it's a chi-squared, and then you actually can do explicit calculations of the of this kind of new expected improvement, and that's what this follow-on paper, um, uh, Uren Holt and and Jensen does, uh, and so that's a really nice paper if you're in the setting where where you really are using this for squared errors. Uh, but if you have a general nonlinear G, then the expected improvement for composite functions doesn't have a closed form, and so that makes it uh, a little bit hard to optimize. Um, so how would you go about it? 
The first, the first thing is how would you calculate uh, EICF? So the, the kind of one can do the obvious thing. So you use the reparameterization trick uh, in order to be able to calculate a random variable whose distribution is what uh, the, the distribution of this random variable would be from a multivariate, uh, a standard normal random vector whose dimension is the number of outputs that are in H. So you just take the posterior mean at the proposed point, the Cholesky decomposition of the uh, covariance matrix across the um, across the outputs. If it's if you're using independent GPs, then this will just be a diagonal matrix whose entries are the posterior standard deviations. And then you can calculate the improvement where you need to be able to apply G to this uh, random random vector. Uh, and then you can average the results and that will be a Monte Carlo, an unbiased Monte Carlo approximation um, to the acquisition function that we're proposing. If you just try to naively maximize that simulation-based estimate, uh, for example, with the genetic algorithm, then you run into a problem that you typically have when you try to do derivative-free optimization uh, of, a, of a noisy output. You, you end up needing, needing a lot of, a, a lot of, uh, you need to average over a lot of replications in order to make your estimate of EICF smooth. And so that ends up making it uh, slow. And also you don't have gradients. And so that, that also makes it slow. So in, in, the, in, the, in that ICML paper where we introduced this in 2019, we actually proposed a different technique, but um, uh, Max Balland at, uh, at Facebook actually, and, and this is a, a paper involving a number of other people there, proposed a different method that works pretty well. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna pitch the, the method that they proposed. So it's, it's sample average approximation. Uh, you draw a collection of different uh, vectors Z, uh, just like I presented on the previous slide, each of which is you know, a standard normal, uh, standard normal random vector. And you can either do that using Monte Carlo or they propose doing it using quasi, quasi Monte Carlo, which works better. And then you, uh, design an estimator of the expected improvement for composite functions, um, which is uh, where you just plug in, you, you do the same thing that I did on the previous slide. Um, you you know, use the reparameterization trick in order to design a, uh, a quantity whose distribution uh, is equal to H of X, apply G to it, oh, and this should say F, uh, F star. Um, the key thing is that you then hold these Z's fixed and think of this as a deterministic function of X. And then you optimize this using a deterministic optimization solver. And in particular, if you're able to calculate the derivative of um, your posterior mean and in the independent GP case of the uh, posterior standard deviations, and you can use um, you know, calculus in order to be able to plus knowledge of the derivative of G, then you can calculate derivatives of, um, of this thing and it's going to be differentiable almost everywhere except at the point uh, where, where this thing um, is equal to zero at one of the samples. And so you can use a deterministic optimization solver and this turns out to be really efficient and, uh, and works better than what we had originally proposed. Theoretically, we know that this is asymptotically consistent. Um, in particular, it finds the, the true global optimum as the number of evaluations uh, grows to infinity. Uh, one other thing that's interesting about this is that there are settings where, you, typically in Bayesian optimization, in order for a method to be asymptotically consistent, you need to measure densely in the domain. You know, for every, uh, uh, for every point in the input domain, if you take the limit as n goes to infinity, there's going to be um, a, a large number, there's, there's always going to be a point that's uh, getting closer and closer to that input point. That turns out not to necessarily be true. You can be asymptotically consistent in this model without uh, that property because of the way that you leverage composite function structure. Um, let me just show some quick, uh, I know I 
meant to end a little bit earlier. The you get really good performance by leveraging this kind of composite information, uh, composite function structure. This is a also kind of a calibration style problem, especially in these kind of calibration style problems, um, where again, these methods, the red, the green, and then the blue is, is EICF, that's the one that I presented. These three methods leverage composite information, composite function structure, while these ones don't. Um, here's some uh, kind of simulated problems, and you see similar uh, kind of performance. Here's an example of something, um, you know, without the composite, without this uh, squared loss that, that does quite well. Okay. So you get a lot of value out of composite functions, and I think there's really interesting things that, that one can do pushing that further. Uh, but what else can you see when you look inside the box? Uh, one thing that we just submitted a paper on is uh, function compositions where, where both the inner function and the outer function are black boxes. An example of a problem like this is uh, the inner function is a PDE that calculates airflow over wings uh, of an aircraft. And then the outer function is a more macro scale simulation that takes uh, what the lift and the drag on the airplane and on the airplane is as a function of how fast the airplane is flying and, and what's called the angle of attack, which is the kind of the angle of the wing presents to the air as it flies through it. Uh, and then calculates, simulates, you know, the, the flight of an aircraft from takeoff to landing uh, and gives you the fuel burn. So you can use this composite information structure in order to more quickly find a wing that's going to minimize fuel burn. You can also extend them to what we call function networks, where we have a collection of, of, um, of functions that are linked together uh, in a network. This arises, for example, in manufacturing problems. This is a, a biomanufacturing example that we're interested in for, uh, for manufacturing vaccine, where each of these functions, so you know, you, you basically you the way you manufacture vaccine is you, um, you know, first you get cells to make some protein, and then you need to you know purify the protein, and then you need to formulate it. So each one of those stages, you can think about it as a function that's taking control inputs and producing an output, and then that output is going on to the next stage, and you again see you know really. Um, uh, significant improvements associated with leveraging that function network structure. You can also do more complicated function networks. This is a kind of a reinforcement learning problem arising from my interest in, in testing strategies for COVID-19. Um, and then uh, there's also a lot of interesting opportunities in gray box optimization in AutoML where Essentially, the idea is that one can leverage the ability to uh, watch an iterative uh, optimization method like, you know, a stochastic gradient descent style method in tuning a deep net to watch it as it goes and um, use intermediate observations about the traces of validation error uh, uh, it, both um, in order to reduce the computational cost of evaluations and also as statistical information that, that you can use to enhance your predictive power. So just in conclusion, um, exploiting composite function information improves, can per improve performance by, by, you know, in those experiments, three to six orders of magnitude. And I think that that's evidence that more broadly, there's a lot of headroom and also a lot of interesting problems um, a lot of fun to be had by looking inside of the box. And if you're in interested in this particular method, uh, you can look at Raul's GitHub, and then it's also available. There's an implementation available in Bowtorch um, as described in this balance paper. So yeah, thank, thank you, everybody. And um, I'm happy to stay on and discuss anything or, or answer any questions. Thank you so much, Peter. That was really a great talk. Um, so we have, uh, so I guess some people are leaving, but we're going to stay for a little bit in case people have questions and also feel free to leave questions in the messages. Uh, so we have one hand from Eugene. 
So uh, uh, for the last little while, I've been trying to consolidate some ideas from um, RL and constrained systems where you have rules about what actions you can take in, in sequence in an auto regressive mm. decision making process. And it led me to start thinking about, oh, can we formalize this or solve this by having the effort of neural network that you know has logics deciding on making actions. Um, and the constraint can be, um, like if you had those available, you can throw this into a mixed integer program solver um, to try and respect those um, those hard constraints um, and emit decisions. And then you know you solve, you have your loss function. And so that led me to think, oh, well, um, right now these you know, second order cone or mixed integer program solvers are kind of like black boxes. And you can sometimes ask them for some, you know, maybe KPT conditions or something at the solution, not always. I'm wondering if you've, if you've had any experience or any thoughts of um, treating um, these kinds of solvers as black or gray boxes and um, how you would approach approach um, optimizing with respect to the parameter you pass it. Yeah, that's an awesome question. I thought a little bit about just, yeah, generic parameter tuning for integer programming solvers as a Bayes-Oft method. But I actually, yeah, it's so natural, but I haven't thought about it from a gray box perspective. Um, I mean, I, I would certainly imagine that uh, probably what I should do is sit down, or a thing that would be interesting for anybody who's interested in this area would be either if you're an expert in integer programming or you know you hang out with experts in integer programming, then um, yeah, like I saw Juan Pablo on the call. Uh, so if you're Juan Pablo, then you sit down and just think about what intuition you use when you're dealing with you know Cplex or Groby or whatever an integer programming solver and um, or the Google uh, integer programming solver, and it's not working, and you're wondering how to improve it. What is it that you look at? Like, do you look at the, you know, the kind of the rate at which the upper bounds and the lower bounds are coming together? Um, is there other information that you look at? Very, at a far, at a, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, it's it's very, yeah, it's, it's it's hard to describe. I think that's the problem. So it's like you kind of look at it and oh, this seems to be happening, but I wouldn't know how to actually formalize it so we could have like a a gray, a clear gray box in the model. I saw I saw one paper, um, uh, you know, uh, another team had you know had done some research and they said, well, if you've done you know the branch and bound things, you've done or you've gotten the cutting planes, then you figure out the cutting planes and you you can do some backprop through that. Um, but I think that the interesting question actually is around um, if you change some parameters in the input, how are the cutting planes right. changed? And I, I think that's that, that would be an interesting thing to that feels like a gray box type thing. Maybe there's something that I think would definitely work. I, I think that it doesn't squeeze all the power out of your question, Eugene. But the methods that I that I hinted at but didn't really talk much about that. Um, well, like, and so Jasper's paper from, from 2013, for example, this freeze thaw idea where you have a collection of different hyperparameters and then you're, you know, you're, you're kind of evaluating them all simultaneously and some of them that are less promising, you're freezing, and ones that are more promising, you're thawing and allowing to continue. Um, I think that if you were to build some kind of ML model over the the trace of you know number of iterations of an IP solver, and then looked at like the optimality gap, for example, as just as your as your outcome, um, I think that that would probably deliver a lot of value. So kind of like a beam search in the space of parameters on those. Like a, like a what? Like a beam? Like a beam search. I think I, I, I sometimes think of free thought as like a beam search. You have these beams and you, mm. you freeze them out and then you... Uh, yeah, yeah I, it is like that. Yeah, so I think that that would probably do much better than simply running every... Like running every possible configuration for your IP solver to termination. 
Um, but I think that there's probably more sophisticated things that you could do that, that would be pretty cool in that space. So yeah, I think it's a great question. What to do there? We have a question from the message box from yeah. Jasper. Um, Jasper, do you want to say or like try to read it? Or I'll read it then. Uh, so Jasper I says- can, I can read it. Um, okay, cool. Yeah, sorry. There, there's a, a crying one month old here, so I may get <laughs> interrupted at, at some point. Um, thanks so much, Peter, for the for the awesome talk. Yeah, so thanks I, for I, your coming and your question. Um, yeah, my question was, you know, I, I've been thinking about gray box stuff, um, maybe like very specific problems, and I always mm -hmm. run into this problem that being able to look into the gray box means you get more evaluations. Right, like uh, if you can see every iteration of a machine learning algorithm being optimized, yeah, then like your your evals multiply by a factor of 100 at least, and then all the awesome GP machinery that we have kind of breaks down, right? And I'm wondering if if you've thought of ways to take advantage of the structure to scale up the approach, and that might look like. You know the multitask work has the chronic refactorization, which is which is really nice, um, but it's maybe not as general as the the general composite idea. I'm I'm wondering kind of what you've thought about in the, in this context. Yeah, that's definitely an issue. We have one thing that we did that it's in that UAI paper that I flashed at the end, uh, where. We so for that paper we're using knowledge gradient because um, you know it's hard to get a notion of an expected improvement when you're not actually observing the objective function. You're getting like a you know you're doing whatever a, an extra n epochs uh, of training for this hyperparameter configuration. Um, so you know that you're actually going to get a lot of extra information from those hundred extra you know or n extra epochs. So what we do is we just ignore, we, we calculate the knowledge gradient acquisition function where you're allowed to keep um, like two of them and you're gonna, you're gonna discard the rest. And that ends up being pretty, you know, much easier to compute than if you were to do a full knowledge gradient calculation over getting all that extra information um, and ends up working, you know, ends up working pretty well. We do some experiments where as you increase the amount of like kind of how much you're allowed to to imagine that you're going to keep after you do the eval um kind of as that increases you don't get a, a whole lot of extra marginal value so that's one idea that you can use um yeah and it's definitely a problem that we're that we're starting to run into one of the limitations of the base opt of composite functions um setting is that there are a lot of cool problems where there's some problems in chemical engineering that I'm interested in where you want to calibrate a molecular dynamics simulator of you know like a protein to data and you get huge amounts of information it's a you're trying to minimize like a sum of squares where the sum is over maybe 10,000 different entries and it's just too much. So then I want to fit 10,000 GPs and, it, and it's just enormous. Um, so what we're trying to do there is again, we, we haven't gotten that to work yet. That's like a work in progress. Uh, but we're thinking about whether we can ignore, whether we can collapse down. It's like kind of looking inside the gray box, but only doing so selectively. Which, which information can we aggregate without losing too much? And which information does is it really powerful if we if we kind of separate out kind of towards one of the questions early on in the talk about um, when does this composite functions framework provide value and when does it not? Yeah, it's a great question. So how um, how scalable is the method um, for you know, deterministic optimization of composite functions um, in the number of inputs to a composite function? Yeah, so it scales. It scales linearly in the number of inputs to the, the, the like it scales linearly in the dimension of the output of the inner function. 
because you need to fit uh, that many GPs um, and and that ends up being the limitation. So um, we, we, it's funny, we've done numerical experiments where you have, let's say 10, kind of on the order of 10 outputs. And then I have problems in mind where I want to do 10,000 outputs. But we actually, I sh we should do some experiments where we do 100 outputs and see if it works. We actually haven't tried that. And, and then, um, yeah, I, I think at some point our current code will choke uh, in between, you know, kind of like as you get towards 100, but I'm not sure exactly how big from a practical point of view you can push it. Yeah, um, I was curious. There's another talk in the series where the authors were talking a little bit about um, partial monitoring games, hmm. which seems like it might be a generalization of this gray box work. OK. I haven't seen that work. Partial okay. monitoring games. Yeah. Uh, where the they they decouple the feedback from the reward, so you can have like a scalar reward, but a vector feedback. Um, maybe there's okay. some interesting connections there. There's also some some interesting algorithms that like this uh, information directed sampling. That seems okay. to work for those. Um, yeah, I was wondering if if you if you had any thoughts on that, but it, it, this was fairly novel to me too. I need to read up more on it. I know about information directed sampling in other in other domains, not having to do with virtual monitoring games. Uh, but I will I'll look for that, and if I can't find that, then I'll 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 find yeah, your email. I'll email you. Sounds good. Um, I yeah, will say that games are games are an interesting place where I'm where we haven't applied these kinds of methods to, and I I am interested. If someone hasn't done it already, then I'm interested in doing it. Because in games, you have these uh, kind of iterative feedback loops, and the objective is defined as some equilibrium calculation. There are also some cool yeah. equilibrium calculations in engineering design, and we're, we're interested in pushing in that direction. So I'll, I'll look for that. Yeah, thanks, Daniel. Sure. Yeah, we do plan to uh, release the videos of all the speakers from this oh, series. Okay. Um, and I think we had a hand from Greg. Yeah, I mean, I was just suggesting that uh, if you have, if 10,000 is too many, you can always do random projections. Yeah, we did try that in a naive way. And yeah, so the, the thing that we tried was, Maybe we didn't think about it carefully enough, but so if you do a random projection of H onto a lower dimensional domain, then the thing that we ended up, th then the thing that's tricky is to figure out what G is now because you've lost a little, you've lost some information. Yes. It might we also tried, yeah. we also tried keeping some, this is also basically a random projection. We tried keeping uh, so you got 10,000 outputs, you pick and you're doing some of some of the squares of those outputs. You keep, you know, 100 of them and then you throw and then you just aggregate together 9,000 of them and you keep their sum. We tried that, but we couldn't find the good rules for figuring out which ones were important to keep and which ones were not important to keep. Well, you could do some kind of coordinate descent kind of thing, right, where you randomly project um, that will be like some kind of slice through your your paraboloid, right? Then you can minimize that, and then once you minimize that pretty well, you could pick like another random slice, and then it would it should be like walking down the, the mm -hmm. paraboloid. Yeah, although if you have ten thousand uh, H's, you 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 you'll still have to take sort of ten thousand steps to explore them all. Depends how much structure there is, right? Mm, yeah, a bunch of steps anyway. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, the statements that I was making about how we tried certain kinds of methods, that was based on some synthetic problems. And I think maybe if we if we were to do that on some problems of like real problems of interest that had had ten had ten thousand outputs, then that might also be important in order to understand whether some of these ideas work. I should say also we we tried it 
uh, briefly, you know, for a couple of weeks and didn't have immediate success. But I, I do think it's, I do think that there, there, uh, it's a thing that we want to continue to work on. Unless somebody here beats us to it. One quick question on the composite functions. So, what do you think is the advantage of the of having a GP model on the inner function? It's like if, it's like, it's like if you take in other predictors and just take an sample neural network, some other sampling. What's the GP thing giving you? You know, it was it's just such a natural thing for us. To, we haven't tried anything else. I don't really think I, it's buying you anything. Um, if you, you know, I. Um, you know, like like I was saying before, I think that to Eugene, I think that if you if you were to plug in a different ML model for that mm. function that was better at modeling uh, in your particular setting, then I think that that's a win. Okay. Yeah. I think this plays nicely with kind of it's just like a different uh, kind of thing that you can improve in the in your approach. Um, this is a dumb. Some question. Um, if, if you have a sum of squared errors as your G, could you um, do an orthonormal projection and then solve in that space and you wouldn't have this problem of um, having to like compare to random projections? So I'm thinking like, I don't know, could you do it in a way with domain to add a bunch of coefficients and still solve the problem or something like that? I don't know. That is an interesting idea. I'm taking notes on all your ideas. They're all made up. Yeah. Oh. I, mean, I think that's a property of ideas. <laughs> I'll, I'll, think, I'll think about these ideas more. Yeah, if, but if it's a simple sum, Eugene, I don't think that would help you too much. Like if it's a simple sum of squares. So do we have a good feel for when, which problems this works best on? I mean, clearly it worked very well on this function where you've got a h of x is the argument of a parabola. And, and there's this two to one mapping. So you can, the sign is important, right? But that's really a property of low dimensional solutions. Do, do we, you know, if you did a strictly, strict linear combination, would you get much benefit? Yeah, so when you do, you don't get that much benefit from from linear combinations. But you might get some because the kernels for the different components of the linear combination might be different, for instance. Maybe. Yeah, you know, I numerically in these in the experiments that we've done with linear functions, it, it doesn't seem to buy you that much. Um, and we are thinking about whether there's anything theoretical that you can do there that says that. Um, because the thing that ends up happening with linear functions is now you're tasked with modeling more things, and so there's more opportunities to screw up. Uh, so if instead you just are modeling the one output, then, um, you know, in a sense, maybe the, the behavior of that thing ends up being more, you're averaging more stuff, and so the behavior of that ends up being kind of nicer. Uh, and so maybe is a little bit easier to model. So I think that pushes, you know, that pushes away from this framework when you're working with um, purely linear functions. And then the, yeah, like the information loss aspect to this um, that you get from the sum of squares or from other functions that are not bijections, you don't get in this. Um, or think, yeah, well, I think, Peter, I, I think there are toy examples you could construct where it's actually very beneficial, right? Like, like suppose your um, your intermediate results were just like sine waves, like you had a single parameter, but your intermediate results were like sine waves with different wavelengths, right? And you sort of knew, you knew this, you didn't know what the wavelengths were, but you knew that they had this pattern and kind of modeling them separately. Like even if your objective was just the sum of them would probably mm. be quite valuable, right? Because if your GP is trying to model a sum of sine waves of different periods, like maybe you can get the kernel exactly right for one sine wave, but not for mm. a convex combination of, of sine waves with different wavelengths, right? 
I guess in that example, there's a question of what, you know, what do you need to tell the standard GP so that it's fair? Um, you know, like maybe in that setting, in order to make it a fair comparison, you would want to tell the... You have a multi-periodic kernel. Yeah, tell the standard GP that the kernel came from, that it was the sum of these functions with, with unknown wavelengths. Yeah, but it's probably harder to learn that than to say, teach tell one GP it's one sine wave. I'll figure it out, right? Yeah, certainly. I mean, we sort of... Yeah. It came across situations, not, not like this toy example, but kind of close to this. So I actually like, did something very, very similar to what you presented like many years ago oh. in, in like at Google. Oh, cool. Yeah. You, you didn't we did have some work domain. No, go ahead. Did, did you publish anything on that? No, it was unfortunately not. I, otherwise, I mean, I thought it was it was interesting, but... Yeah, we didn't, we didn't get around to, but there was more domain knowledge that could go into specific, you know, the specific modeling of, of your H function. Yeah, that's very interesting. So it had this same kind of flavor where it was the sum of different, like kind of periodic. Well, thing. a nonlinear function of a bunch of metrics, right? Oh. Okay, okay. Yeah, but to answer your original question, Greg, like when does this work? When does this when does this give you like five <laughs> orders of magnitude, like those graphs? And when does it give you, you know, not much or nothing? Um, you know, it, I, it's still an open question. I, I don't, mm -hmm. I don't really know. Yeah, it seems like it requires more research. <laughs> um, all right, shall we wrap it up? Yeah, thank you, everyone. Um, you are an amazing audience, and you're super smart and very interesting. Uh, and it's wonderful to get an opportunity to present to all of you. Yeah, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Peter. My pleasure. Okay, bye, everybody. Bye.